So we're in the middle of a series called Destroying Distractions, where we're taking time to look at, in this crazy world of a lot of things demanding our attention, our time, our love, um, how can we follow Jesus and what are practices, what are things that can help us in that task. Um, so in this series, we spent a few weeks on Sabbath and the role of rest, um, finding true rest in Jesus, but also finding rest for our bodies, our minds. Um, the last couple weeks, we talked about meditation and prayer. And today we're going to jump into another one that you'll find in the Bible, but uh, from my experience as a church, we don't talk about it a whole lot. I don't even talk about it a whole lot, um, but I think it can be helpful. And so we're going to be looking at another spiritual discipline today, um, along with meditation and prayer, that can be helpful for our walk with the Lord Jesus. Another thing that can help us direct our attention towards him. And just an example of where you'll find this, um, when you look in the book of Acts, you get a, a glimpse of what the early church lived like, what they looked like, what they did. And so you have this passage in Acts 14 where Paul and Barnabas have just been in a town. Um, they've been preaching and people have come to faith. And then we're told this as they're getting ready to leave this town. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. All right, so Paul and Barnabas, they, they come in, they appoint elders or pastors, as we call them. Both terms are, are appropriate. Um, in every church there. And then with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord to whom they believe. So they, they pray, they fast, and then they commit them, commend them to the Lord. So this is just one example of where you'll find fasting in the Bible. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Now, from my experience, like I said, we don't talk about fasting a whole lot in the church. Again, uh, most Christians can probably tell you a lot about prayer, but fasting is not as common to most of us. Um, and so we're going to take some time to reflect on it, because what you'll find is this is something in the Old Testament of the Bible— You'll find it in Jesus' teaching, you'll find it in Paul, you'll find it in the life of the church. And so we're going to take some time to reflect on fasting. And I have a couple of disclaimers, but before we get to that, one of the things that we'll see here is that fasting, like all spiritual disciplines, is meant to train us. Right? So when you think about discipline, one idea is training. You're developing rhythms and habits and patterns that train you for something better or something great. And, and particularly with fasting, what we're going to be looking at is that it helps with some self-control. So we talk about distractions, right? There's a lot of things that say, hey, look at me, come spend your time here. When you think about temptation, right? Temptation to live apart from God. There's an idea that there's things trying to control us. And so we want to have a certain level of self-control. Proverbs puts it this way in Proverbs 25, 28. A man without self-control is like a city broken into and left without walls. So we don't have walls around Denver, right? This is not a, a practice you see anymore. But um, back in the ancient days, right, you didn't know when somebody was just going to show up and try and sack your city and raid it. So cities had walls around them. It was one of the defining features of the time of a city was it had walls around it, which is why you'd only have certain gates you could enter by, and you could defend those, you could close those off. And so Proverbs will say somebody who doesn't have self-control is like a city that has no walls, right? Anyone can just come in and have their way with it. So any temptation, any distraction can just take you. And so part of what discipline is, part of what fasting will get at, is this idea of self-control, being able to control ourselves in the face of whatever comes upon us. Now, it's not just that. Here's, here's kind of the definition I want us to work with, is that fasting is abstaining from something good for the sake of self-control and in order to receive something better. We'll talk about what that better is, but fasting is abstaining from something good, so it's a good thing that we're saying no to, in order to develop self-control, the ability to say yes, no to things that we should say yes or no to, and in order to receive something better. So right away, notice, this is, they're good things, but we're going for something better. Now, before we really jump into it, I want to make a couple disclaimers. Um, because when you throw out something like fasting, especially if we're not uh, incredibly used to it, it can, a lot of thoughts can pop in our head. So I want to make a, two disclaimers real quick. First off, we're speaking about the spiritual discipline and not the health trend. <laughs> um, if you're looking for the latest trends in reducing inflammation or something, I don't know. I'm not your guy. Um, and I, I want to say this because most of us, when we hear fasting now, the only time you hear it is usually in the context of like intermittent fasting or something. And I'm just here to say that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the spiritual discipline. And we'll look at this, but really the difference is what is the why? Why are we doing this practice? And it's, it's for spiritual purposes. So that's disclaimer one. And then the second is that this is a discipline that can be helpful, but it is not a law to fulfill. This is true of most of these disciplines, right? But this is not like if you're going to be a real Christian— you need to start fasting this much or in this way. Especially, um, we'll talk about some alternatives, but when the Bible talks about fasting, that word, it's 
pretty much exclusively about food. And, and I realize that there are a lot of people, whether your health, um, whether your age, whether your um, history with something like an eating disorder can affect your relationship to food. And, and so for some people, I would not say stop eating, right? Um, and so I just want to be very conscious of this. This is a helpful discipline. And again, we'll talk about alternatives to food. But for some people, maybe a big part of God's redemption in your life is you feel comfortable eating and you don't worry so much about what you look like. And so I'm not here to say, well, stop eating again. Um, I want us to reflect on this, and food is going to be our baseline conversation because that's how the Bible talks, but we will talk about others. So I just want to, I want to get that out there right away. So if you're listening to this, you're not like, oh, geez, I can't imagine. Don't worry. Um, for some people, right, if you're like going through treatment or your health, not eating might not be helpful. So um, disclaimer number two. So disclaimer one was this is not the health trend. Disclaimer two, this is a helpful tool, but it's not a lot to fulfill. God doesn't love you more because it's like, all right, you fasted. You're, you're in my, my VIP section. I want to look at some of Jesus' words on fasting. If you look at the Sermon on the Mount, one of Jesus' most uh, famous teaching sections, he has all of these different teachings about praying for those who persecute you. He has the Beatitudes, the blessed are the poor in spirit, all of that. In Matthew chapter 6, he teaches the Lord's Prayer, which we looked at last week. And then immediately after teaching on prayer, he says this. He says, and when you fast, notice right away, he says when, not if. So Jesus is assuming that the Christian church will do this to some extent. Not everybody all the time, but that this is going to be part of the church's life. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast anoint your head and wash your face that your fasting may not be seen by others but by your father who is in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. So Jesus is talking about rewards here, right? One way to think about rewards is just what do you get for doing it, right? So your reward for winning a game is you get a little trophy, right? Your reward for all the papers you turned in in high school is that you got a diploma at the end, right? There's a, it's just the consequences, the thing you get for what you did. And so Jesus is talking about the rewards for fasting. And he's first off pointing out what they're, what they're not supposed to be. So I love this. So he, he's highlighting people and saying, don't be like those guys. Um, Do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. So it's kind of self-explanatory, but you can just picture people who they're fasting in, in their dedication to the Lord, but they want, it, they want people to know that they're fasting. And so you can just picture, like, disfiguring your faces, just walking around like, oh, you know, oh, fasting, oh, man. Right, because what they're hoping for is that people will look at them and be like, wow, it's a holy guy right there. You know, I just, I just had a cheeseburger. He's fasting. I'm not as holy as him. They want to be seen. They want people to look at them and think, man, they're so righteous. And so Jesus is saying, that's not the point. And if the whole point of your fast is to be seen by others so they can see how holy you are, that, they got the reward. That's all the reward you're going to get. People think you're cool. Great. That's not the reward you're after, though. Jesus is saying there's a different one. Rather, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, right? So, um, so this is like the equivalent of like getting dressed up today, grooming, fixing your hair, putting on makeup, you know, wearing decent clothes, right? Look like you're just normal, right? Like you're putting on your, your best appearance, that your fasting may not be seen by others, right? So when you're fasting, don't, you actually want it to be so people don't even know. I'm fasting not so people see me and say how cool and holy he is, but I'm fasting for a different reason because God who sees will reward you and God who sees in secret will reward you. And so what this is getting at, there's a different kind of reward. There's something different that we're after when it comes to fasting. It's not just a way to show the world how Christian and how holy I am, but I'm actually seeking something different from God. And to understand this, you kind of have to think about what the experience of of fasting from food is like. Again, this is the baseline the Bible talks about, so it's, it's a helpful idea. Right, so first off, food is a good thing. Your body was made for food, and food was made for your body. <laughs> it's, it's kind of built in there. And so food is a great thing. And so when you don't have food, when you stop eating, your body has a hunger, it has a desire, because it realizes, I'm missing something good. It longs, right? This is why um, I had a buddy who was trying to cut weight for wrestling. I might have shared the story. And he would just sit in class looking at pictures of cupcakes and just scrolling through because he just longed for food, because he wasn't eating, right? That's, that's what your body's supposed to do. Your body's supposed to say, I need food. And so what this is, what the, the act of fasting does is it's taking this real appropriate reaction. My body is desiring this thing that it's lacking, this good thing, 
And one thing you'll notice in the Bible is fasting is almost always paired with prayer. It almost is always labeled as prayer and fasting or fasting and prayer. Because the idea is not just I'm going hungry, but the idea is I'm going hungry and I'm redirecting this urge towards God. Because Jesus, he also fasted. He fasted for 40 days. Don't start with 40 days, okay? Go on the record right now. Um, don't, don't be like, all right, tomorrow, a month and a half. But Jesus fasted 40 days, and the devil came to him and said, hey, you know, if you just listen to me and not your father, I could, you, know, you could have bread to eat. Doesn't that sound good, right? You could have all this power. And Jesus responds to him by, by quoting Scripture and saying, man does not live by bread alone, but by the very word that comes from the mouth of God. And later, Jesus will talk in John chapter 6, how to have life, you need to eat the bread that has come down from heaven, and that the bread that came down from heaven is me, Jesus says. And, and so, here's the why. So the why is not, right, the, the same why as like intermittent fasting. It's not to be seen by others. But Christian fasting connects the experience of physical hunger to our spiritual hunger for the bread of life. And so the goal is not just to, to not eat, but rather to say, God, I, I desire this food. My body needs this food. Help me desire and need you the same way. Because whether you know it or not, you do need the bread of life who is Jesus in order to truly live. It's just, that's just a reality. The problem is our bodies don't always respond the same way. We've been kind of lulled by sin to not hunger the same way. And so what fasting does is it actually connects a real experience that you can't avoid, right? When you're hungry, you can't ignore it usually. You're, you're, it's just constantly on your mind. And so the idea of fasting connects that experience of longing and desire and redirects it. So you, you'd fast, maybe, you know, not eat a meal, and you spend the time in prayer, praying for people who are in need, praying for yourself that you might grow in faith, and praying, God, help me desire you like I desire this food right now. It's connecting that, that real experience with the need for Jesus. Now, as I said earlier, you can fast not just food. Biblically, the word fasting is only used in conjunction with food. Uh, but there's other examples that you can get at that get a similar idea. And again, and one thing I want to highlight, though, is that these are good things, um, not fasting from, like, eh things, but good things. But one of the places you'll find a similar idea is in 1 Corinthians, when Paul is, in chapter 7, he's talking about relationships. He's a section on singleness, and he's like, yeah, I wish, you know, I wish you were all single so you had more time to dedicate to the Lord, but um, it's good that some of you are married, and if you're married, here's some responsibilities, here's what it looks like to be married in a godly way. And one of the things he says he takes a lot of like our, uh, our wedding language, right? What's mine is yours and yours is mine. And he connects that to the human body. And he says, when you're married, your body is now their body and their body is now your body. There's a mutuality there. And so you no longer have control and ownership over your own body. It's actually a shared endeavor. And so then he says this really interesting thing. He says, do not deprive one another. Okay, so he says, don't deprive one another of your body except perhaps by agreement for unlimited time, that you may devote yourselves to prayer. But then come again together again so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Your self-control again. So for Paul, and this is true biblically, and this is true of just the way the world works, um, the way God set up the world, things like sharing a bed and sharing of your bodies in sex and in marriage, those are all just one thing. This is why when Abraham and Sarah, they're trying to conceive and they can't, and Sarah's like, take Hagar, my servant. It says Abraham took her as a wife. Right? That, that act is just like the same as marriage. It's just all wrapped up in one idea. And so the idea of this, what Paul is getting at, this is not just like a nice perk. This is actually essential to the marital union. And so you wouldn't deprive somebody of that except if you're fasting from it, like food. Right? You need food to live. For a marriage, this is, this is core to it. And so the only way you'd fast from it, the only way you'd, you'd abstain and deprive is mutual agreement, right? So not one, you can't just be like, I'm fasting from this. It's, a, it's an agreed upon thing, right? For a limited amount of time. So, hey, let's not for this amount of time and let's take that urge, that desire, and direct it towards the Lord. Let's take that, that time, that energy, and that desire and say, Lord, help me desire you. Not in the exact same way, but with the same um, passion. Let me redirect this towards God. And so what you see here is you see these examples of fasting be this, this idea of there are things that we need, there are things that are good for us, and I'm going to take time to abstain and, and not have them, whether it's food for a period of time, in this case, 
um, the joining of together of a married couple, but for the redirecting. It's not just quitting for a while. It's not just taking a break. It's, it's this is being redirected towards something better. And, and so there's this, this huge connection between our physical, our mental desires and needs and prayer and meditation. If Jesus is the bread of life, how can I desire him the same way I desire physical bread right now when I'm hungry, right? If Jesus is the one who, who is faithful to the end, how can I take a break from this act of faithfulness and redirect it towards the Lord? So again, this is not just taking a break. It's filling that and redirecting it towards something better. Because the goal of all of this, right, if, if you're going to fast from something, the goal of all of this is to be drawn closer to and to look to and to talk to the one who abstained from every good thing. The whole point of this is not just to make ourselves miserable or show how cool we are or feel like, yeah, I did it. Sure, there's an aspect of self-control, but the main purpose is to spend time to do things that draw us closer to the one who fasted and abstained from even his own glory, his own immortality. Think of Jesus. He's been around since forever, eternity. And he chose to take on human flesh, and all of a sudden he could get hungry. He didn't have to do that before. And then he, he actually fasted here on earth too, but he, he set aside his relationship with the Father for a time. He was forsaken on the cross. He hungered. He was beaten. He was left abandoned. He emptied himself of everything for something better. And for him, that something better was you. See, when we fast, it's to draw closer to Jesus because he's our Savior. When Jesus gave up everything, it was for broken, lost people like you and me. Paul puts this beautifully in, in his book to the Philippians when he says this in this famous section, likely an early church hymn. Jesus, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So notice here, Jesus, who is, who is truly God, emptied himself of everything. Does God die? No, and yet, yes, because he let himself die. God is glory and powerful. Did he, did he exercise all that glory and power? No, he became a servant who could be stabbed and beaten and crucified. And, and there was all sorts of chances where he could have gone out, right? He could have listened to the devil. Yeah, I'll eat. I'll, I'll take the power. He could have, the night of the Garden of Gethsemane, when they were about to arrest him, he could have snuck out the back. <laughs> he could have ran away. But he had the self-control to willingly take the path that his father had laid out before him so that you and I might have life, might be redeemed. So when we fast, we're sharing in, we're partaking in, and we're being pointed to this Jesus who abstained from all good things. Every, every good thing became empty so he could save you. And he rose victoriously so we might have hope, have life, have a future. That we know that one day, there will be a day where we lack nothing. And there will be no more scarcity, there will be no more distractions and temptations pounding at us everything will be good. But to get there, this Jesus had to give up everything. So the act of fasting is, is a chance to give up something in an attempt and a hope and a prayer. God, use this experience to draw me closer to you so I might not lose what's most important. That I might not find my security and my comfort in even food, relationships, or all these other earthly things, but I might find it in you first and foremost. So to close, I just want to give you some ideas and some reminders about what fasting could look like. Again, this is, this is a, a possibly helpful thing, but it's not like, all right, you've got to fast if you're going to be a real Christian, okay? Um, but you'll find this throughout the Bible. So a couple possibilities, what this could look like. So one old church practice is a Sunday morning Lord's Supper fast where you don't eat anything on Sunday morning before communion or the Lord's Supper. The idea being, I'm going to be hungry on Sunday, but I'm going to walk up to that table desiring bread and wine because this is actually Jesus' body and blood present in there. And so I'm going to choose Sunday morning to fast, okay? Not, I'm just going to have water. And we make it hard. We have a coffee lounge, so you're going to really show some self-control here. Um, again, these are optional, but that's one, one possible practice to kick off Sunday's feast day um, through the Lord's Supper. Another one's a lunch fast. You can do this at work. Just take your lunch hour. If you have a 30-minute break, you could not eat for those 30 minutes, 
and then spend that 30 minutes in prayer. Make a list ahead of time. Who are people that I know have things coming up, people who could use my prayer, and I'm going to spend that 30 minutes, and as I sit there and I'm hungry, I'm going to redirect that towards the Lord in prayer. Um, you can do it like a single food item. So again, this is where if you don't want to give a food all together, maybe there's a food you love. Like every day, I end my day with a popsicle. I don't know. I just, popsicles. And so I'm going to fast for a period of time from popsicles. And every time when I usually would have my nightly popsicle, I'm going to spend it in prayer. I'm going to spend it meditating on God's word. I'm redirecting it. And there's also, as we just looked at in 1 Corinthians, you could do a non-food fast, such as a certain activity or pleasure. So maybe it's social media. Maybe it's your favorite show. Again, maybe every Saturday night, um, I spend it watching this series on Netflix. I watch The Office. I love it. For a month, I'm going to not watch The Office, and instead, I'm going to spend those Saturdays in prayer or in meditation. I do want to highlight, though, no matter what it is, um, this is not giving up a sin or a vice. Um, I was trying to find examples of different fast people have done, and some articles are like, give up gossiping. And I'm like, if it's a sin, that's not fasting. That's just repentance. Um, <laughs> so there's a difference. So if this is something like, I shouldn't be doing that anyways, um, there's forgiveness, but this is where you come and you repent and you, and you turn from that. I want to highlight, this is, a fast is something that is good. This is something that, it, that can be helpful and, and godly and pleasurable in the best way, and I'm going to give it up for a time and to redevote that to prayer, to meditation, to God. So again, it doesn't have to be food. You can do other things. This is kind of where there's a nice personal touch. You can think of what would be helpful for you. What would, just ask this question, what would I truly miss, Right? If you, if I would, oh man, I can't imagine time without that. Maybe try some time without that. And I want to give just a few reminders. Um, start small. So this is where don't start the Jesus plan tomorrow. Like 40 days, no food. Um, this is where, again, a, a lunch, um, a week of not doing a certain activity that you usually do. Um, so start small. This is training. Again, so if you're running a marathon, you don't think tomorrow, okay, I, got, I better just run 26 miles a day until I have it figured out. Start with a mile, and you go up to two eventually. So start small. Use resources. There's stuff. You can talk to me, and there's other people. If you know somebody who has fasted from something, you can ask them. How was the experience? Do you have any recommendations? Um, you're not on your own in this. Um, the Bible has ex- is more pre- uh, descriptive that this is happening than prescriptive, but there's biblical passages too. Um, remember the purpose. Again, the purpose is not to look holy. The purpose is not to win God's favor. And the purpose is not to um, self-improvement even. It's to be drawn closer to God. And so if, let's say you're doing like a, a sugar fast, right? I'm going to give up treats because I love sweets a lot. And then you get into the office and somebody has a plate of cookies that they made homemade. Um, you don't have to say, and I, you shouldn't say, oh, I just gave up sugar. <laughs> oh, dang it. You can just say, oh, those look so good. I have to pass this time. Maybe next time, right? And you don't have to lie if somebody's like, did you give them up? Right? Like, do you hate my cookies? Like, no, I don't hate your cookies. Um, but don't make a deal of it, right? Jesus' model is like, make it so people look at you, they'd never know. So if you're going to give up something, nobody has to know. And that's the way, again, the goal of it, the purpose of it, is to be drawn closer to Jesus, not to show to the world. And then finally, let the Lord be your strength and your fill, right? This is the whole point. I'm giving up something so that way the Lord can be what truly satisfies, what truly strengthens me. I want you to think about this for just a moment. Jesus, when he was in the wilderness, became fully human, fasted for 40 days, out there with the devil, one-on-one tempting him. He's all alone. Whatever temptation you face, Jesus is with you. The one who's overcome will be with you every step of the way. Let him be your strength and your fill. So I hope that this can be something you consider. I highly encourage you to think about what this could look like. But at the end of the day, whether you fast or not, let the one that we look to be the one who gave up everything, who emptied himself for what was truly best and what was truly best in his eyes was you and was me. May he be our strength and our fill. In his name, amen.